and there will be no more evil, there will be no more injustice in the world when God does that. Sometime at the end of time. At the end of time. Jesus taught us. The apostles were following this. They were listening to this. They understood. That's where, for example, in one of the teachings of Jesus, you know, they, they say one of the Sadducees is trying to mock Jesus. How can you believe this? There's a woman, you know, she was married, and her husband died, and she married again. And here, the second husband died, and, and then a third, and a fourth, and then she had seven husbands in a row. And when she dies, and she gets to heaven, who's going to be her husband? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great five kid who's trying to give his teacher a hard time. <laughs> you see, because, because the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees were always arguing with and this was a good argument for the Sadducees. So they threw this at Jesus. And Jesus, and that's where Jesus answered with that strange question. He says, look, he says, in the kingdom of God, there are husbands and wives. That, that's not it. That, that's not a problem. He says, on the other hand, I'll give you another problem. You know, we say of God that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all dead. Is our God a God of the dead, or is he a God of the living? If he's a God of life, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be alive. And the Sadducees went away thinking, what? <laughs> you know? So this was an argument. But what, what is Jesus saying there? Jesus saying in the resurrection, he's not saying that the, what we live in this humanity, which is ours, doesn't count. But he's saying that there's, there's, a, there's a newness in the resurrected life, which is very different from what we know now. We, we consider what makes us happy. We consider what makes us happy, kind of, the feeling of security of being with people who love us, uh, being secure financially, uh, being free from worry and from guilt and from disease and everything. You know, this is a good life. And Jesus is saying, the happiness of God is going to offer you in the resurrected life is not quite the same thing. Not that what we hope for here isn't important, but he's saying that's not what is going to be the source of our happiness. The source of our happiness in the resurrected life is going to be fully our relationship in God. The Spirit of God living in us fully and connecting us to God in a perfect way. And in that perfect connection with God, we will be connected with all others who are also connected in God. So we will be in full and total communion. And we will be in communion even those who are not dead yet. That's what we mean by the communion of saints. We, all those who are connected to God, you know, are connected with each other. Beyond death, we are connected with each other. And that connection is going to be the, the, the permanent and the ultimate source of the happiness that we will know in the resurrection. But on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, something changed, something radical changed. Because everybody thought that on the last day, God will raise us all from the dead. And what did the apostles experience on Easter Sunday? They experienced an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Jesus was risen. This was unexpected. Nobody had ever expected this. This was not part of the tradition of Israel. It was not part of what the, the Pharisees taught. It was completely out of the blue. The apostles were not expecting this. They might have believed in a resurrection of all the dead at the end of time, but that Jesus should be risen here and now. This is why the Pharisees couldn't accept that. Most of the Pharisees couldn't accept that. They said, well, yes, we believe in the resurrection, but at the end of time, when they all rise together, there's no idea that somebody rises uh, before time, before that final date. And that's why 
St. Paul said, well, because Paul was a Pharisee, he said, well, I'm sorry, he is risen. So the conclusion is, the final days are here. See, Paul just said the final days are here. It's just that what we thought would happen in a flash, in a moment, is being extended in time. And it starts with the resurrection of Jesus. Not only does it start with the resurrection of Jesus, it will end with the power of Jesus' resurrection spreading out to inflame the whole world and all of creation and all of humanity. And in that moment, what, what we call the coming, the second coming of Jesus, his parousia, the Greek word, his manifestation in glory, is when what started on Easter Sunday in history will accomplish history at the end of time. The last days have already started. We are in the last days. Not meaning that tomorrow the world is going to end. Meaning that we are in the last days that started 2,000 years ago. The last days take a lot of time. The last days too started 2,000 years ago. How long will the last days last? Nobody knows. They might last 24 hours. Maybe we were, were in the last 24 hour period. Who knows? The last days might last for another 2,000 years. They might last for another 200,000 years. The important thing to know is that the last days have already started in the resurrection of Jesus. And what will happen at the end is that all those who, are, who receive the gift of life, who are open to receiving the gift of life and the power of Jesus' resurrection, will be caught up in that power. And this is what we mean by the final judgment. Because what will be the final judgment? The final judgment will be that power of life which is in Jesus, which we call the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is already alive in us. So Paul says we're already risen. Already the power of the resurrection is in us. Right? So he says that power of the Spirit which is in us, that power will kind of reach its maximum state to the point where anything that is not of that power will be destroyed. All evil will be destroyed. All injustice will be destroyed. The injustice of the past 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 years, the injustices of each person's individual life will be somehow set right. And that's what we mean by God's judgment, because the word judgment is close to the word justice. What does a judge do? A judge makes justice. Our problem is too often we think that justice, a judge's job, is to reward the good and to punish the evil. You know? Punish the bad. Justice. I don't know if some of you read Standard Freeholder once in a while, but this morning, I was, as I was having breakfast, I was reading Claude McIntosh often writes interesting things. And, I enjoy writing reading Claude's. Claude was writing about the last public hanging that took place in Cornwall and how, you know, um, it, it, uh, the, the trial was quick and the guy was found guilty and a few, few weeks later he was put to death. And, and Claude, in his good style, says, is Claude here, by the way? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> because then we're going to have an interesting discussion. And Claude said, see, that was justice that was swift and clear. Well, is that truly justice? Was the wrong that was done set right by this guy's death? No, because the person who was killed is still dead. And the people who lost that person, they're, they're still grieving. Justice is undoing what is unjust. And we cannot do that. And killing the murderer does not do that. And anybody who thinks it does, I would suggest, needs to read the scriptures. Because it is not in vengeance that we set a right, a wrong, right. Only God can somehow reach into the injustices that were done to us and set them right. How God will do that, I have no idea. Here's one of the mysteries. <coughs> Montreal is in that direction. God will set all things right. How? I have no idea. When we'll get there, we'll be surprised. But this is our faith. That that's what God will do. All injustice will disappear. All evil will disappear. And here's the question. 
Will you be attached to the evil? Or will you let go of the evil that is part of your life, part of my life? We're, we're all complicit in evil. All, each one of us is complicit in evil. St. Paul said that's part of Catholic Christian dogma too. We are all sinners. We are all complicit in evil. So at the end of time, when God's spirit in Jesus kind of invades every part of our history and of our beings and destroys all evil, if you hold on to the evil, what's going to happen to you? Um, that's the notion of a final judgment. And so this is why we have to let go of the evil. 